Hello, everybody, and welcome, very warm welcome to today's IID Debates event, which is all about exposing the hidden value of export housing in informal settlements. Today's event is co-hosted um, between IID and Habitat for Humanity, and we are really delighted uh, to have you all here. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to um, join us um, and explore this, this important issue. That's it from me on housekeeping. Um, so I am now very delighted to introduce our moderator for today, which is Alexander Apsan Fadiani, who is a principal researcher here at IIED. Alex, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much, Juliet. And it's great to have you here with us and to bring together this fantastic panel. Well, as we are aware, we are seeing a deepening of a global housing crisis. And we know that this is affecting particularly the majority world living in informal settlements. If we are to address uh, today's uh, uh, climate emergency, and if we are to accelerate the advances of the SDGs, we will need to radically intensify our actions to improve housing in informal settlements. And uh, now is really the time to have these conversations and to move into real actions. Uh, last, uh, in the last few days, we had the high level political forum who has uh, reviewed uh, the stagnation of the urban SDGs and where there has been a serious call to, to make a real change to advance target 11.1, uh, which is related to housing, access to housing and, and adequate uh, basic services. And at the same time, also in the beginning of this month, we, we've seen uh, UN Habitat approving a resolution in accelerating the transformation of informal settlements uh, and uh, slums. So we do have uh, a, a global call and a global alignment calling for actions in, in this context. And we really need to see how we move from dialogue to, to real impacts on people's lives. So in the, that context, we are discussing today about how can we use evidence that demonstrates the impacts of improving housing in, uh, in informal settlements in in actually making this change happen, in addressing the housing crisis and bringing about change on the ground. So this is really the topic of our conversation. And we have here a fantastic panel that Juliet, maybe if we can put that uh, slide back up again, that I can tell you a little bit more about the people we, we brought together today to have this, this conversation with. We have, uh, we're gonna start with uh, my colleague, Camila Cosinha, who is a, a researcher here at IID on housing justice and uh, my friend and colleague, Jose Manuel Roche, Roche that is an independent consultant, uh, and uh, he's a fellow at, uh, the, at OFI, at, the, uh, at Oxford University. And, and uh, we together, we, we were commissioned by Habitat for Humanity to do a report on the impact of improving housing in informal settlements in terms of human development. And they're gonna be telling you a little bit about the, the, the evidence data that we collected and some of the key highlights from that report. Then we'll be followed by, uh, by inputs from uh, Raquel Ludemi. She's an advocacy manager for Habitat for Humanity in Brazil. And we're gonna be talking to her about how that type of evidence can be useful for her work in Brazil at, at the local and national level. Then we're gonna be uh, discussing with um, Lorena Zarate, who is uh, a founding member of the Global Platform for the Right to the City. She has been the president of Habitat International Coalition in the past, and uh, she, She's an extremely, uh, kind of, we always like talking to Lorena because she has a kind of a, a clarity in, in her way of thinking that really helps us navigate the complexity of uh, international mobilizations and international solidarity. And we're gonna get some insights from her. How can uh, grassroots uh, social movements be utilizing this type of evidence to affect change locally and globally? Then we have with us uh, Julieta Peruca, who is a deputy director for The Shift. And again, uh, she has been doing fantastic work in this field. The Shift is a really extremely uh, important uh, organization that has been doing advocacy in terms of uh, housing rights internationally. And we, and we have, they use evidence in such a strategic way. And we wanted her to, to talk to us about what, what more can be done in, in this respect. And then finally, last but not least, we have some input from Amanda Entriking. She's the, she's the one that actually commissioned the work. Uh, for Habitat for Humanity for the, that we did. And uh, she, she's a director of global affairs and advocacy at Habitat for Humanity International. 
And we were really gonna ask her, so what next? You know, what's Habitat for Humanity gonna do next with this evidence? Well, how, how are they thinking about uh, advancing change on the ground uh, uh, through the use of this kind of evidence? So that's, that's our, our setup. But before we start, we wanted to have a, 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 a a kind of set of questions to you, to the audience, to the participants here, those with us in the, the Zoom call. We have a poll, and uh, Juliet, maybe we can launch that. So we have a few questions to you, uh, which uh, are some of the questions we we addressed in the report. And maybe I give you a few minutes just to 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 read them. But if we were to massively improve housing in uh, informal settlements across the world, what's the kind of returns we would see in terms of income? health and education and here's some questions please fill in what are your thoughts and we, we will disclose the answer by the by the end of our presentation today so if you can please uh, submit your your answers there and uh and then we uh if, if you know if you read our report you would know the answer so it's okay you can answer the right the right answer and that's okay uh, and it would be great uh to hear your thoughts on that so I think we will let you uh, let you uh, answer this question as we move forward, and uh, and then we well, I'm going to bring in Camila Cosina, who's going to start the presentation about our our report. Camila, I'm handing over to you. Thanks, Alex. Sorry, I was um, put in the presentation and I was mute. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much, Juliet, and everybody who is joining us today. I'm going to be very brief. I'm trying to summarize some of the key messages, but also a little bit of the background of how we came with this report and its findings. Uh, we are going to do this presentation together with Jose Manuel Roche. Um, as Alex already said, this is a report that was commissioned by Habitat for Humanity for the launch of their Home Equals campaign that looks specifically at uh, housing informal settlements and in improving house uh, and trying to assess what are the impacts of uh, improving housing in informal settlements if we were doing this at scale. I don't need to, in, I mean, Alex has already done a, a good job in introducing like what is the kind of crisis that we are facing here. And for us, always the starting point was to acknowledge that access to housing, to adequate housing is a human right, and the global housing crisis is a human right crisis, and that is already contemplated by international uh, frameworks and commitments. But for the task in a way, and the, the invitation from Habitat for Humanity uh, at the beginning of, of this report was, even, even if we recognize this, beyond recognizing that the access to adequate housing is a human right, and that's, that has a value on its own right, of course, what would be other meaningful impacts of securing equitable access to adequate housing and informal settlements. And more so, if housing improvements take, took place at a massive scale in a country, what will be the income, health, and education impacts for the residents of informal settlements? And income, health, and education, uh, for those who are not less familiar with it, are the three components of what is called the Human Development Index, the UNDP measures annually. So we wanted to understand, like in that kind of standardized measure, what will be those impacts, uh, as I say, if housing improvements took place on a massive scale in a country. We're not going to give you too many details about the methodology. That's something that you can find in the report. But just to give you a bit of a sense of the rationale of it, what we did was to start for what uh, research has already found out, what research says about what are the linkages between improving housing and these three dimensions. And we review hundreds of, of uh, reports, articles, research that will show some of those connections. And from there, we try to identify some of the variables, some of the linkages, and to make some assumptions. And inevitably, this will imply some degree of simplifi simplification in order to build a model that could actually uh, extrapolate some of those grounded research into more kind of global analysis and from there we model impasse and we try to build some um, some recommendations and some findings that will be again grounded with the complexity of reality um and the way we did this and i'm gonna go through very very um very very quickly is to understand to what extent and in which ways housing was an enabler of these three dimensions of uh, HDI. 
And just to give you like, again, a, an overview, we started to look at like lots of research very grounded that started to link, we find linkages, for instance, between um, access to piped water and, 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 uh, and health, particularly of children, or of concrete floors and issues of habitability in housing and the connection with uh, a series of, of illnesses, but again, particularly related with children. In other research that will engage more specifically with mortality and the housing materials that we know is one of the dimensions of adequate housing, but also also with other dimensions of housing, for instance, how overcrowding has impacts on particular kind of, of health outcomes, uh, but also location, for instance, and how location, another very important dimension of housing, is connected with certain, uh, certain aspects of health. Um, also, even uh, some research that has shown quite, a, quite explicit linkages between housing tenure and different uh, outcomes of in health. And the same with it with education. And again, I'm not gonna go into my detail, but research that shows, for instance, linkages between the impediment of learning and a, lot, a series of variables that are connected to housing, or again, housing overcrowding and uh, rates of dropout of schools. Research that shows more specifically linkages between tenure stat status and child's education achievement. Um, and again, overcrowding being a very important variable in, also in education in one research, particularly look, looking at linkages with literacy tests, but there are other, other research that shows in, with other variables of, of education. Location again, and location also linked with uh, issues of gender disparity and school enrollment. That is a, a very important variable that cut across many of the, of the evidence that we found. And also, again, linked to tenure status, but also the tenure security, how forced, forced resettlements and the risk of evictions have actually a very important uh, um, impact on issues of education. Access to water and in general to any kind of infrastructure and basic service also uh, linked, linked to education, and particularly, again, with a gender component, for instance, for uh, the, the time spent particularly for girls, for, by girls on collecting water and their impact on their access to education. We did the same with income. I'm going to go very quickly here. Uh, issues between electrification and income, uh, between water supply and access to basic service and income, uh, issues of affordability and the amount of money that families spend uh, yearly on uh, repairing houses, for instance, issues of security and tenure and income, again, location and, and, and access to livelihoods and employability, and in general, the whole kind of linkage between the housing construction industry and uh, and uh, income and, and GDP more generally. So I'm going to pass it to Jose now. What we did with that was basically kind of trying to try find all these like kind of grounded findings and trying to build some assumptions in scenarios that will make us from the more kind of moderate to the more optimistic scenario. So Jose, now, now to you. Thank you, Camila. So we move then to model the impact of access to adequate housing in terms of the Human Development Index dimensions. Uh, this table that we have here presents assumptions in our model, and they were based on the evidence emerging from the literature that Camila presented earlier. So for example, we know that improving access to adequate housing will reduce child mortality, and by avoiding preventable death, life expectancy will increase. And then that, of course, would have an impact on overall human development and the Human Development Index, the HDI. So the statistical model uses this assumption to generate three scenarios, as you can see in the columns in the table, an optimistic, a moderate, and a cautious one. Next slide, please. So here are the top results. First, as much as 10.5% of economic growth may be attributed to direct impact of improving housing in informal settlements. And as a way of comparison, this is equivalent to the fast economic growth experienced by China between 2005 and 2010. And in contrast, countries with high human development experienced 4.5% average economic growth during the same period. So such large increase in national income is an outstanding outcome, uh, no doubt. And, and it's worth, of course, noting that this increase will likely be greater than the cost of improving informal settlements. The World Bank estimated that countries would need to spend up to 
8% of the GDP uh, in improving informal settlements and housing. So 10.5% economic growth would be a significant return. And so next we look at health and the model estimates that life expectancy could increase up to 4% for countries around the world, adding 2.4 years of life on average. Or in other words, more than 730,000 preventable deaths could be avoided annually, a number, a number that is higher than eradicating malaria globally. And the figure shows that countries will, of course, considerably reduce morbidity and mortality as a result of progressing social, um, uh, as a result of progressive policy in housing. And so finally, on education, in terms of we, we see that the expected years of schooling in some countries would increase by as much as 28%, or in other words, as many as 41.6 million additional children and youth people could be enrolled in primary and secondary education. And this, just to put it in context, this is equivalent to 16.1% of the total number of children and youth people currently missing education globally. And so this is what the model is telling you the impact would be. And so next slide, please. We then look at the joint effect of the, of the three human development dimension to estimate the overall effect. And in a, in a nutshell, the model shows that providing access to adequate housing could lead to a jump of up to 18 places in the HDI country ranking and a change in the human development level from low to medium or from high to very high. But let's see an example of what this means. Consider the case of a country similar to Uganda represented here by the red dot in our graph. If access to adequate housing in informal settlement is provided, the country would overtake others like Rwanda, Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire or Marit Mauritania, reaching level closer to Zambia, Kenya, and Cameroon that you see at the top of the graph. Next, it would jump certain places in the ranking. But what is more important, next, what is more important is that it would move from low to medium human development. That's the magnitude of the, 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 the improvement that we'll see. And these are, of course, all impressive gain, but we are only measuring the direct effect. In addition, there is a whole set of what we call spillover effect, which now Camila will discuss in some more detail. Thank you, Jose. And very briefly, just to wrap up and give the floor to our panelists. Um, we understand that, of course, these three uh, variables are not uh, don't, don't cover the full spectrum of impacts. And we have a whole section on the on the on the report about how the impact on political systems, on like on care systems and environmental systems is inevitably something that also will be affected by uh, by increasing uh, housing. I mean, improving housing, and that in turn does also sustain human development index for uh, human development for everyone, not just for those who live in informal settlements. Um, just to go very briefly through what the, re the recommendations of the report are, and I think this is for us very, was very important in the development of the report, and we had a kind of as a series of workshops with with other actors with the, from the civil society from the academia that help us shape a little bit what uh, what those recommendations are. Is that it's not just about building housing but the how is also very important so in a nutshell the recommendations um, are around four main areas so why one is understanding that uh, housing is an infrastructure of equitable urban development and i think the idea of housing as an enabler and in the context of the sdg discussion of sdg 11 as an enabler of development more widely is something that we need to reinforce the second one is the idea that housing solution must be integrated and comprehensive to generate human development returns. So it's not just about building housing, but also the how, making it in ways that actually involve a civil society that recognize the current efforts of uh, different groups to actually produce uh, 
the habitat in which they live. And that's also very, very important and central part of the recommendations. The third one is about uh, how we bring this conversation to the inter international development discussion and how we understand informal housing, uh, informal, uh, informal uh, settlements upgrading and uh, access to adequate housing as lever for international development, then that should be something that hopefully we will pick up in the conversation. And last but not least, it's also about prioritized knowledge and data on housing and the impacts on housing that it's by, about, and for informal settlement communities. The reason why we had to do many of these kind of assumptions and building this kind of uh, model that maybe is not so accurate for a specific context, but it's more about making the case about the methodology is because data is a big, big, a big uh, gap still uh, in many places. And uh, not only because it, that, that, that data may not exist, but also because the data may not be recognized and may not be recognized in the efforts that people on the ground are uh, mobilizing today to uh, map and, and document the, the, the realities, the aspirations, and the needs in informal settlements. And I will stop now and give it back to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Camilla. Uh, thank you, for going through those, those inputs. Uh, and yeah, please, uh, all of those here in the, in the call, share your thoughts and questions in the comments in the Q&A box, uh, and we will try to pick them up as we move forward. But let's bring Raquel into, into this uh, conversation. And Raquel, you, you are based at, at Habitat for Humanity in, uh, in Brazil. And uh, you are, I know you're, you, you're, you and your organization is involved in a series of uh, advocacy activities trying to influence uh, the, let's say, the policy formulations and this kind of return for more progressive uh, policy making in Brazil. How has this evidence or evidence like these ones contribute to the work that you're doing in Brazil? So tell us a little bit more about those activities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you and congratulations to all, all of you involved really in developing this research. I think it's a powerful piece of evidence that really contributes to the broader advocacy uh, environment, really. I think not only for civil society organizations, but I think there is a powerful information also to those engaged in the in this, but also in developing and implementing public policies, looking towards housing justice and more uh, equitable urban environment. So as I said, I am uh, involved uh, in the uh, advocacy efforts of Habitat for Humanity in Brazil. So just to just to give you a little bit a little bit of background, we at Habitat for Humanity Brazil we are, work very strongly with what we call evidence based advocacy. So we nurture nurture our partnerships and our work on the ground, and the way is we do that is to, through providing. Can you hear me? All right, it's. Yeah, okay, so I'll move on. <laughs> Sorry about that. So one of the ways we uh, work together with partners is into developing and putting together, collecting data and, and shaping some evidence uh, to support our evidence-based uh, advocacy efforts. So one example, a quick example, of what we've done in the past that has led to very important uh, outcomes uh, was under the zero evictions campaign. What is called, some of you might have heard of, it's basically a national coalition that had different working groups and Habitat for Humanity was engaged in, in several of those working groups. But one very important one was what we call the mapping working group. So we, we basically developed a national database to show uh, where evictions and threats of forced evictions were happening and occurring. And that was a very powerful tool to basically provide not only uh, to those involved in street demonstrations and into more general claims, but also uh, how can this be an input to those shaping uh, public policy. So for instance, the Supreme Court used our data, used data that we provided as Habitat for Humanity uh, under this zero evictions campaign to, um, to provide uh, basically national uh, national decisions to stop forced eviction. So this is one of the one of the the the, the 
efforts that uh, the uh, so some of the ways that we use our our data and the data that we collect collaboratively to support our advocacy efforts. So just to give you a very quick example. So now jumping to this report that, that we just saw uh, a quick uh, introduction to it. So I think this is a very, very powerful uh, piece of information and very powerful advocacy tools, really. So one of the things that I would highlight is that it really shows the connections as Camila is an enabler of the Human Development Index. So I think this is something that we knew but we didn't have the data, we didn't have the evidence to back up. So I think showing this connection between housing and health and income and education, those human development index, I think this is super strong and a very powerful uh, way to really uh, put the case that housing is an enabler of uh, human development. Another way that I think this can be very useful is that it really shows that uh, it, it shows the need for intersectoral policy. So we uh, we could, if we do improve housing, we could have uh, outcomes and positive outcomes and impact in other aspects of, of uh, social and human development. So I think this is a very strong case also. But, and here are some concerns that I would like to bring into uh, how can we, uh, take this more general uh, more general findings and bring those and ground those into a country level uh, or a country context. Uh, and especially thinking of a country of the size of Brazil and with the histories and with the uh, background really of civil society and how can civil society bring those uh, evidence into policy dialogues and so on. So one, one aspect that I would like to highlight is that the very, um, the even though the term informal settlements is very consolidated in the international debate, the we uh, in Brazil, uh, the civil society sector, we're trying to avoid the, the word informal because it really emphasizes the aspects of informality that can lead in some cases, in some contexts, to uh, some level of hostility and some level of criminalization of the so, so social movements and those engaged in defending human rights and housing rights and so on. So this one aspect. And what the reason I'm bringing this uh, into this uh, discussion is, is really to call attention that we need to be very, how do we translate those? Not only when we talk, uh, in terms of the uh, the findings itself, but also the terminology that we use. I think that, that we need to be very cautious in how do we translate that. Um, another thing is that when we move from these more general findings into really contributing to a specific uh, legislation or policy that's being developed, that is being drafted, I think uh, two questions, maybe three, will arise eventually. So the one question is the how. How does improving housing or in, uh, housing conditions and in informal settlements, how does that improve the other aspects of life that we've, we've been doing? So one of the things that I was thinking is that, of course, we do, we do have some examples, but it would be really powerful to have uh, examples or maybe some findings on pilot or demonstration projects through which this has been explored. So let's say improving housing has led to health outcomes or to positive improvement uh, uh, in, in health outcomes uh, or educational outcomes. So I think that would be very interesting to, to have further information on, on demonstration or pilot projects that shows that. And the reason I'm saying that is that sometimes if we improve only housing, but let other aspects of the, the, the human development really uh, drop. So let's say other aspects of the living conditions really in those settlements drop. So we would require, we would be improving housing, but other aspects would need to hold still or to be improved uh, on, a similar, on a similar rate. So it would be interesting really to see uh, examples on where uh, that has been explored and that has actually led to some positive uh, impact as we've seen. So the question of how, that, 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 that was my question around the how. The other question would be at what cost? So I, I, I noticed that at, in some, um, at, in, at some point in the, in the report, 
uh, the report mentions that the costs of improving, uh, of having massive large scale improvements in, in informal settlements uh, would be actually lower than the benefits of it. And, and there's actually a figure around six, six trillion US dollar or something around that. But then uh, this is really uh, uh, not enough if, we, if we're talking about, uh, not enough information if we're talking about uh, improvements and the cost or the, the resources that are needed to do or to have that large scale, massive scale in a country of the size of Brazil and with the complexities and, and uh, with the complexities really that we find in Brazil. So I think that would be the, the what costs. And the other one would be where to start, what's next. And, and I think the recommendations that Camila just provided, I think this is a first step to really think on, because if we're talking about uh, improving informal settlements, there are so many aspects that we could do. And there's really, it's really difficult to imagine a thing that would happen all at once. So I think it would be interesting to think of phases of those improvements and how and where to start and so on. So I think those are some of my initial thoughts just to start the conversation. Uh, uh, yeah, so I think over to you, Alex. Wow, uh, I think you have uh, outlined a whole research agenda for, for us as a community for the next 10 years. So thank you very much. I think we have a, our job cut out now. So, I mean, fantastic. Uh, thank you so much. Just a quick reaction to the last point and a few conversations that I've had with colleagues like Jane Wairu uh, based uh, in, in Kenya and Diana Mitlin, they often tell, they often say that uh, the place to start is with basic services. That, uh, that's moving and that we don't need to. And then Sheila Patel often says, let's not wait for security of tenure, let's get things moving. And uh, because uh, we, we need to, to get uh, things improving. There's just a few reflections from conversations ongoing. Uh, and I think we can come back to, to some of this. Let me bring Lena, let's bring you, you into this conversation. And uh, I, I know from your work that uh, uh, we, that that uh, evidence and numbers in, on themselves are not enough, right? I mean, we, we need uh, a few extra bits in, into the equation to make sure that uh, we have that kind of impact uh, and we actually change mindsets and policies and practices on the ground. It requires uh, a few other components into the mix. And I wonder if you can, you can tell us a little bit uh, more from your experience, uh, uh, what are your thoughts in relation to this debate? Thank you, Lorena. I'm going to make my contribution now in Spanish. So thank you so much for the invitation, Alex, Camila, and to be part of this panel today. It's so good to be able to share with you, dear colleagues, and having all attendees here as well. As you mentioned, we are almost 10 years being part for the global platform for Right to the City. And, and there is a campaign that we launched for the International Coalition and Habitat that's part of this group and the International Alliance as well for Habitats. And there are many, many networks that work work together on urban issues, focusing on the groups and the individuals and traditionally that are marginalized and excluded from society. And it imposes a very important look over the dwellers of these communities. That's why that I would like to highlight some things that have already been mentioned here. Rachel has already talked about the language and the categories as well. It's for many decades, we have been working on our groups and we have been questioning these uh, etiquettes for the dwellers of these communities, these titles, these labels that they receive. And they don't want to put their responsibility over the private and public entities. And in fact, they should treat them normally. And they use this labeling just to choose stigmatize and criminalize these informal settlements. 
This is why that from he, uh, we work on production and um, public management of habitat. This is why to have the habitat as a category, and it's not housing, but it would be the housing described as a human right that you have established very well in the report with all the components in terms of location, access, infrastructure that brings habitat and the right to the city. Therefore, one of the critical points over here is the following. The improving housing programs together with a program of improvement for the district or the neighborhood, and this is not done, but that should it should be a very important recommendation in terms of how we should add value to improve the neighborhood as a whole. And, and then we also have to think about management, management, social management of habitat. It has to do with how, as Rachel mentioned. Let's say that we are successful with this report, and then it can have investments in terms of financial resources in order to improve our neighborhoods. But how it should be performed? How should we invest? And how are we going to administrate? Who is going to control? And how is the governance going to take place? And what kind of return over investment? investment do you expect? It's very important because very easily we can uh, have other problems that previously we have, we could see many countries of great investments uh, in housing. Theoretically, um, socially speaking, but people don't have access to that because they are located in very inadequate areas. And also the production of this housing is only done by the private sector. So there is a great economic contribution in the neighborhood, in the social grid of the community, of the neighborhood. That's why I could say it's critical. And that should be a great follow-up of this research. And the report is so good, so solid. But we know, we know it's very difficult to have all this data, not only having them, but being able to analyze them. And as Jose was saying, we have to create a modeling of these scenarios. Of course, it's difficult, it's expensive, and usually the organizations are not capable of doing so. And everything should be done with a specific approach, uh, with the right to, to housing. And we all can see that in the report linked to the other aspects of HTI. Never before we had had such a thing. It's very valuable. But how could we complement to that? We have to think about where these resources go to. And then uh, we should complete that with something that we were thinking about through Rick, or Rick, that is to study the social processes of um, a social management of habitat, including resources, uh, not only economic resources, but also um, the contributions of the neighborhoods. And then we would have this look in terms of what is missing. And I believe that we want to complete this look with what we already have, what is already present in terms of skills, capabilities in these neighborhoods. And even though that, even those that are in these very precarious settlements, that they have capabilities to do, to do things. 
And we, we have to see other social actors that would participate, that is coming from outside the, ne the, ne the neighborhood, but look at the neighborhood, see what they already have in their hands. But of course, we have to measure things in terms of micro, micro and macro economic impact of the social production of habitats in the local level, national level, regional level. In Mexico, for, for over a decade, we did that, and it presupposes a very important contribution for the country's GDP. So these are very strong arguments so that this uh, thing could happen as a complement and being managed by the community and uh, strengthening this social grid. And this is central for the right to the city because it has to do with diverse economies, equitable, inclusive economies that would uh, strengthen the solidary, popular uh, economy. And of course, we want to talk to you and have a specific meeting with the dear colleagues from Habitat for Humanity, with the platforms and networks and organizations, and even with some governmental local networks to see how we can use this report and complement it and also link it to different initiatives. We have a lot to do, but of course, it, but it is in the local, national, international agenda, and we have to start articulating initiatives in order to avoid duplicate wars. Incredible. Thank you so much. And we don't only have an agenda that's coming up from uh, from Raquel and you have a few other suggestions, but a call for a meeting to articulate uh, collective uh, engagement into this. So I guess uh, they, we, are, we, are, we are developing an action plan. I wasn't expecting this in this call, but that's fair enough. I think that's uh, that's what we need. So in light of this, uh, Julieta, I think you, you, you have a, quite a few, you know, you have some shoes to fill in now because uh, the, the bar is getting higher and higher as we're moving forward. And, uh, and, I, and what are your thoughts, given that I think the shift have done so, so amazing, like exposing the, the impacts of uh, financialization of housing and really bringing some, uh, some killer numbers to demonstrate uh, the type of uh, violations of housing rights uh, that uh, exist through the accumulation of wealth uh, in real estate development. Uh, and uh, and I guess this this report shows uh, a little bit kind of the other side of the equation in terms of what uh, what uh, the kind of uh, returns that they can can generate by by improve. I really wanted to get your thoughts on uh, on how on on the use of evidence of this type of research in, in advancing uh, the right to, to to adequate housing. Yeah, thank you, Alex, and uh, and thank you, Lorena. Every time I, I listen to you, I always feel like my mind is blown. It's true that you have such a clear way of speaking, so really appreciate that. Um, first, I wanted to just start by congratulating, as everyone else, is the IED team. This is such an amazing report, and I think what you've done here has been really valuable. Um, so I just kind of wanted to highlight some of the ways, as Alex mentioned, which this report has the potential to make a global impact particularly and selfishly for our work at The Shift. Uh, but in order to do that, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our work and then what, where we find ourselves, what we're trying to, to fight against um, globally in order to move forward the right to housing. And then we can see, I think, where this report clearly fits in in order to do that. Um, so just a little bit of a warning, I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent on financialization, and then I'm going to bring it back to the report. Um, so just to start, the SHIFT is a human rights organization dedicated to moving forward the right to housing. And as a result, we work with a variety of stakeholders, municipal governments, local governments, grassroots groups, people experiencing violations of the right to housing, and really anyone in between who wants to work with us and wants to speak with us. Um, and we're really working kind of at the intersection of housing, finance, and climate change. But a major issue of focus, as Alex said, for us has been what's known as the financialization of housing, which we define as the recent structural changes in housing and financial markets, where housing is used as a financial instrument to park, grow, leverage, and or hide capital. Housing, as a result of the financialization of housing, has become the most valuable asset on earth, 
worth almost four times the global GDP and more than 20 times all of the gold that has ever been mined in human history. So I don't know if that puts it in perspective. Uh, we're constantly trying to figure out what that means, but you know, it's, it's mind, mind boggling the value of residential real estate. Um, but of course, the business practices that underpin financialization often target low income and affordable housing, impacting the most marginalized in our communities and making it truly impossible for the realization of the right to housing globally. But what's critical to understand is that financialization is based on a globally dominant neoliberal paradigm, which diminishes the role of communities, grassroots groups, but also governments as housing providers and drivers of housing systems. And it prioritizes, of course, the role of private actors as the true drivers and the, the people that actually have the know-how on how to create efficient housing systems. So this is true. This is really underpinned by an erroneous belief that the market through simple economic theories like supply and demand will take care of housing need and create prosperity and equality. And of course, we know that this isn't true when housing systems are left largely unregulated and unchecked. Time and time again, private interests fail to address the housing needs of low income and marginalized groups. But despite its abject failures, which we can see across the world, but in particular within the housing crises that are being experienced in the global north, where financialization is most dominant, the financialization of housing is being sold to and bought by governments across the world as the solution to the housing crisis and the key and the central point for economic development. And this includes those countries that are tasked with upgrading of informal settlements in the global south. So, Many developing economies, as well as international and regional financial institutions, continue to actively promote policies that push financialization as the dominant strategy for addressing the critical need for housing, as well as economic development, despite evidence that such policies are often fueling socioeconomic inequality, are fueling people moving into informal settlements, are fueling homelessness, inadequate housing, and are just truly not capable of realizing the right to housing, particularly for the most vulnerable. I think it's important to know as well that not only do these policies not work, they actually also often rely on international actors who come in, exploit housing systems on the basis that it's going to support housing systems, and then walk away with the profits, leaving very little financial gain for countries who liberalize their housing markets to these international actors. So I think to bring it back to the report and what I really love about this report is that it's the basis for a potentially very powerful counter narrative to the one that we're seeing on financialization that's being sold to, de to developing economies across the world. I think through the findings of this report, we can better argue that true economic prosperity and human well-being will not be found through typical strategies of financialization, which are often things like developing mortgage markets, allowing private developers to build enough so that it trickles down to everyone, exploiting land and housing for profit with the vague promise that in so doing, we will all be able to share in the wealth and have a piece of the pie. I think through this report, we understand that what we actually need is for governments, for IFIs and for all development stakeholders to understand that the way in which we can ensure sustainable development, equity, and prosperity is by understanding housing as a fundamental human right and necessary infrastructure that must be carried out with urgency and through using a human rights approach. I think the, the way that you have employed the seven characteristics of adequacy in the report is brilliant, and we're definitely going to be using that to show to governments that truly what we've been saying through international human rights law Housing is far more than just four walls and a roof. Housing, understanding the, this holistic approach to housing through the seven characteristics of adequacy is more than just a moral imperative. It has benefits. It's going to create the approaches that you want to see in your most marginalized communities. Um, I think with this help of the findings of the report, we can also build a global narrative that affirms that the upgrading of informal settlements and the realization of the right to housing for marginalized groups is the best policy option for governments. 
because it's the only way in which we will not only embed sustainable development and human well-being, but also achieve economic prosperity, hopefully within our planetary boundaries, of course. And you've done a really great job at kind of entrenching, obviously, climate justice, uh, the GBA plus lens on all of the work. So yeah, again, it, it's, it's going to be a really important report for when we're talking to governments and when we are trying to build out that global narrative, that counter narrative to what we're seeing ar around the world. Um, I think the only thing that I would add uh, to the report, and I think that we will be adding as we do this work uh, on the global stage, is that we need to include, both because it's a human right, but also because it's essential to the right to housing, the idea of access to justice. I mean, access to justice is crucial in realizing rights. Without access to justice, if we can't claim our human rights, then our human rights are illusory. So we need proper mechanisms of access to justice in order to really bring the right to housing, uh, really realize the right to housing. I think oftentimes governments uh, and international development stakeholders are really afraid of access to justice. When we talk to governments about developing claim mechanisms for access to justice, they feel that it's a stick that we're going to beat them over the head with. And what they don't understand is that, you know, if governments are really serious about taking on this report and taking on the recommendations of this report, they're bound to make mistakes. It's going to happen. This is in, these are innovative approaches that haven't yet been applied in other places. But if you, alongside innovating, create very thorough and robust mechanisms for access to justice, then you can use those claims as a means to course correct and actually improve the policies before you get too far down the road. And I think oftentimes governments really fail to understand this value of access to justice and that's something that maybe we could think about highlighting in future in future projects. But I also understand, I mean, you talk about a data gap in the report, and I think there isn't more of a data gap than when we look at how access to justice improves public policies. We just don't have that information. And so it's really hard, therefore, to make that claim. But maybe that's something, I mean, you've done such a brilliant job um, with, with this modeling, that maybe that's something we could think about in the future. But I know it's a little bit out of out of left field. Um, but yeah, I think I'll stop it there and, and throw it back to you, Alex. Brilliant, sir. Valeta, thank you so much. And I, 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 you know, it's really interesting and inspiring this, uh, this idea of access to justice uh, as a means to keep innovation and in terms of you know, course, course correcting and, 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 and keeping access to checks and balances and really ensuring that the principles that are embedded in, into those recommendations, that's, as, as Lorena was saying, the how prioritizing the how to make sure that uh, those returns are guaranteed and, and pushing also the reflections of, of, of our, our report into a much broader conversation around models of economic development that's really, this is situated within a broader discussion you know, in terms of prioritizing well-being, human development, rather than purely profits uh, and growth and economic growth per se. So, so yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much for, for pushing us in that direction and very interesting. And I would like to bring now Mandy uh, into, into, into this, this chat. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I mean, those are, I know you, you have been thinking with your team uh, around uh, taking this work forward about doing more research uh, and, uh, and translating this into impactful influence uh, influencing in terms of different uh, advocacy work that you're doing at uh, local and global uh, spheres. So tell us more about this and how, how you see these, uh, these, these advocacy activities taking place and what are your next steps? Awesome. Thanks, Alex. And thank you everyone for your remarks. Um, it's been so great to hear from Lorena, Raquel, Julieta, obviously Camila and Jose too, um, which we've discussed the outcomes of the report so many times that I always love seeing it presented again. Um, really helpful to hear everyone's perspectives and the value that they see in the report um, and how it applies to their own work in their own spaces. So it's really just, um, I've, I've really enjoyed the discussion so far. So I hope I can contribute to that. Um, I just kind of wanted to take a step back and just explain like Habitat for Humanity 
uh, you know, Raquel spoke to Habitat for Humanity in Brazil, um, uh, but we're a global housing organization. We've been in this space since the 1970s, functioning in about 70 countries around the world. We have a few of our, our peers from different places. I saw Farai from Habitat Zambia uh, in the chat there. Um, and we deal with housing in totally different ways in each of those places where we function. Um, and there was a question from James from IIED about, you know, what is it? What is it upgrading and how much does it cost? And James, it depends. Um, and that's the point. Uh, it's going to look different in each place, depending on the need, the context, both like political policy environment in and also in terms of like, is it on a slope? Is it a dry environment? These incremental approaches is what we're trying to really enable um, as a means of, of upgrading and improving at the household level. So that can look like adding a bathroom, improving a roof, painting a roof white so that it reflects the sun so it reduces temperature um, within the household uh, on a day on a day to day basis in, in, in these kind of extreme temperature times. Um, but the campaign we is a is a means of advocacy is a means of achieving what we want to see throughout our network and the home equals campaign is the reason we commissioned this report and the reason we started engaging with IIED which has been very fun um I'll put the link to the campaign in the chat for everyone's reference because uh we realized I mean, we have realized for a long time as a global housing organization engaged in advocacy um, that it's hard to make the case sometimes. I think qualitatively, everyone understands that a house is important. But when you can't make the quantitative um, statements that clear of how it connects with all the other things that you, a government or a community are investing in, that if you don't address housing adequacy while trying to invest in education or basic services or women's rights, that you're actually not going to get as far as you want to, it's been a really hard case to make. So this is the piece of research that we've been wanting for a very long time um, and, and also wanted it to be global because there's a global story to tell here. But the impact is always going to be local. Housing is a local issue. And that when we're engaging with, because we do as a global organization, engage with multilateral organizations or donor governments in the global north, um, they're not looking at housing as, as a main entry point for achieving their development gains or development um, interests. So thinking through how to make that case not just qualitatively, but quantitatively was really the, the reason for sharing this report. So you asked about our ambitions, um, Alex. We have as an organization, an interest in ensuring local stories of lived experience are positioned to influence global stages. So the work that is occurring at Habitat Brazil or Habitat Zambia is really the bread and butter of what we want to be sharing with the world. Being able to take this really important piece of global research, demonstrate that this is having an impact or the, the work to that aligns with this research on the ground is having an impact locally and making sure that international actors, national governments are, are seeing that impact both qualitative and qualitatively and quantitatively. Um, Habitat organizes its campaigns as a collection of campaigns. So it's one way of doing advocacy. A campaign includes um, communications assets, research assets, but there's also an important component of bilateral engagement in these things of actually speaking with governments directly, locally, nationally, and internationally to make the case. We're being quite ambitious and one of the campaigns within the Home Equals campaign will be what Habitat International is engaging in and seeking to influence the G7 they comprise about 60%, 70% of overseas development assistance um, uh, for the world. And they don't think about housing. They don't really think about rapid urbanization. They don't really think about the needs of people in informal settlements, which are growing, right? Informal settlements we know are, are densifying and expanding. Um, so really thinking about 
if you're providing 60 to 70 percent of overseas development assistance focused on all the things that are highlighted in the report gdp uh, livelihoods education lifespan and health then you really need to think about housing and incrementally not four walls and a roof as julietta says that's one thing that we say often is a house is so much more than that and we have to be able to demonstrate that so the hope is to have a line of advocacy work to share this at the glo on global stages um, to ultimately get the attention that international development is has a missing component uh, and that should also have an impact so while there's um, application of the research at the local level in the places where we are operating on the ground, there's also this ambition to share the, the, the messaging internationally. And that's, we're definitely going to be using the report as a means of leveraging uh, that message. Where the hope really is to have impact for people. It, this, is a, this is really about um, improving people's lives. And so that's why um, this idea of local and global is really important to us the impact uh, should be felt um, by individuals on the ground. So that's really how we're hoping that the, the report has an impact in that way. To, to, it's about awareness raising, but also about changing policies and systems that actually affect people's lives and enable them to improve their housing more affordably in a safe context and also achieve their rights, um, which sometimes are not enshrined and not accessible unless policies and just systems change in order to do so. I think I'll leave it there. I think I made my time. <laughs> Looking forward to Great. questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Thank you so much. Uh, and yeah, it's been uh, wonderful to work with, with the Habitat for Humanity team, a real pleasure uh, throughout the process and, and very inspiring as well. I'd like to bring uh, uh, Juliet back uh, and share us the, the result of the poll. So we have for question one, in terms of income, we have only 50% of our, or, well, some uh, 30, uh, well, the 50% got it right, 10.5%, and, uh, and uh, some of you more optimistic. Uh, uh, it's around 18.2%. Uh, and if we go to the question number two in terms of uh, health, uh, we, yeah, I think it, it, the numbers, 39% uh, of you got it right, it's 730,000, uh, and, uh, and 45 of you were more optimistic. Probably you are right. It's just that we didn't have the numbers to point. I mean, if we do, consider the spillover effects as, uh, as uh, Jose was mentioning, we're probably gonna get into the, closer to the, to the numbers that you have indicated here. And in terms of the, um, how many out of school children will be back at education is one every six out of uh, school children. So, so, so again, uh, we, I think 42% of you were more, more optimistic uh, and, and one uh, every four, so which would be great uh, uh, to, but again, uh, maybe, maybe I think we just, yeah, maybe we, we are right uh, on, on that respect. Uh, I would like to bring Mary, Mary's questions for me is very important. And I'd like maybe for us to have a think about it is, well, urban and slum informal settlements upgrading has been promoted mainly by NGOs uh, uh, at, 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 for at least 60 years. So why do we think that government institutions have refused to or been slow in recognizing the priorities you mentioned? So, so is it, is it uh, we you know is it just a lack of uh, of evidence uh, for, for that uh, what are the you know we, we are we in the climate debate uh, we have seen how for example we have uh, plenty of evidence demonstrating how uh, earth is is warming up uh, due to our is man made uh, our emissions and that hasn't necessarily translated into real policy change or change on the on, on the ground so uh, this is a very important question to us uh, in terms of the, the, the why haven't governments really changed the directions and uh, and maybe that's a, let's let's put that to the panel. I mean, what are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, why have governments refused to to take into account uh, the priorities and needs of those living in, in informal uh, settlements uh, in, in in that scale? And anybody would like to have a go on on that on that question? I can give it Do a we have quick. an extra hour to, yeah to exactly <laughs> it was a conversation i was at the world bank affordable housing conference uh last month and it was a discussion actually there by some experts in the field um regarding the investment in the 70s and 80s 
uh, regarding sites and services, which is a means of, of it was a means of, and still is a means of, of improving informal settlements, upgrading them, uh, and that the after action reviews um, in hindsight were too short that the impact and the benefit of a sites and services approach after five years, there was not as much success as had been hoped. So it was scrapped as an idea and um, looked at as unsuccessful. But more recently, individuals at the bank have gone back and taken a look and said, okay, 10, 20 years after those sites and services efforts, they're thriving communities. That was the intention. It just took longer than initially thought. So my understanding, my hope is that there might be a shift in thinking through the idea of upgrading at this point in time. You know, these ideas are cyclical, um, but that uh, impacts are not immediately seen and we have to be patient. <laughs> Um, so that was, I think, a really interesting learning that I recently came across that I can share as a part of the answer. Lorena, can I bring you in? Yes, I knew you were going to put your hand up. Go on. <laughs> yeah, uh, all friends. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very important question, as you said, and very, very difficult to, to answer to. And of course, that will depend on different contexts. But I will say that for me, a couple of keywords in that, um, of course, generalizing. Um, but I think one is fragmentation. So it's not the lack of, of action necessarily or the lack of uh, convincing. <laughs> um, and even in many cases, it's not the lack of funding, uh, lack of resources, or even institutional capacities. Uh, but I would say it's more like fragmentation and uh, lack of continuity. Uh, so basically you do have different programs you do have different initiatives but for example you will have some national level programs that are not necessarily uh, connected with the local level programs or vice versa like local level municipal level policies or programs that are not very well connected with national level policies um, also fragmentations in terms of um, we usually think that solving, and even with, with this report in the sense that solving the housing issue is kind of a task for housing ministries only and the housing policy only. So from a right to the city approach and even taking this, this um, approach from the report, but like entering from in a different way and vice versa, you will say that improving health education access to water and sanitation, et cetera, in the settlements where, and, and access to jobs. And that will actually improve housing conditions too, right? So I think that fragmentation um, is, is a problem. So not necessarily the lack of action, but fragmentation. And the other one is the, the, the lack of continuity. So we do have programs and in many cases, very successful. Uh, and then they stop because we have a change in governments. Uh, we have elections, change in government. So, we do need, and that's also a mandate from a human rights approach, uh, state policies and not just government policies, right? So an approach that will, that will provide continuity for these um, investments. And, and, and the last piece, of course, is who controls that and who is who's benefiting from those investments, right? And how that actually um, gets into the communities, into the neighborhoods and in the, in the integration of those neighborhoods to the, to the city as a whole. So, that will be my, my reflection on that uh, very important question. Thank you, Lorena. I, I would like to bring, I mean, there's another question. I have one question. Like we have, the time is running out. So I have one question that I'm going to be asking Raquel to come in with. And another one that Julieta, I think the, Raquel, there's a question around uh, whose responsibility should it be it's from Priscilla uh, to improve housing in informal settlements, particularly if government policy states that the housing development is the responsibility of the citizens. Uh, yeah, like, how do we engage into meaningful participation without devolving and uh, responsibility to those that are most vulnerable and increasing the burdens uh, on them? So, you know, meaningful participation, but without uh, uh, like this unfair uh, uh, distribution of responsibilities. How, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And there is actually um, a term. In, uh, Again, language and terminology can be tricky uh, in the sense that anytime we talk about self 
or the social management of investments and the social function, anything that has to do with the public participation, we may fall into the risks of putting the burden on to those who are the who have the least to do massive and large scale improvements that are required. So I think, uh, although I think, and I think we we there is a consensus that uh, we need multiple multiple stakeholders really in when dealing with such complex issues. I think, especially in contexts where inequalities are so deep, such as in the global south in general, like in, in Latin America and in Africa and Asia and so on. I think there is a major responsibility of state and of the government in addressing the root causes of those inequalities, first of all. Uh, but, I, but again, as Lorena said rightly, I, I think there is a, a, there is a huge uh, relevance into engaging other stakeholders. And Julieta also mentioned the the brought into the conversation the role of the judicial system in general. How can we move towards access to justice and to say this is a basic human right that it's not being uh, fulfilled uh, housing basically more general, but also the habitat more broadly as in the approach of the right to the city. So I think I think it's a matter of, of uh, uh, ma mainly responsibility of the government, but engaging and allowing and enabling basically uh, participation and input and management and basically a, a participatory decision making when it comes to broader and massive large scale uh, development as housing improvements and improvement of, of uh, human settlements and informal settlements <laughs> as, as we uh, as we have it in the in this meeting today. Fantastic. And uh, in a couple of minutes, uh, uh, how do you do housing finance without housing financialization? I think uh, uh, the, you have a question here from uh, from Farai around how, you know, uh, holistic slum form up, uh, settlement upgrading inevitably requires sustainable financing. Are there any good case studies uh, of financing models, especially that bring together government and private sector? Uh, so how do we, you know, do you, what are your thoughts around the distinction? How do we make this distinction between making sure we have uh, access to finance and without financial financializing the, the housing market? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I will say just very quickly, I put in the in the chat a report that Leilani wrote when she was the special rapporteur on, on informal settlements upgrading using a human rights based approach, which really clear, clearly lays out what obligations governments have with respect to community engagement and it, it might be of interest as far as the financing question what we need is very robust human rights outcomes so anytime any government is engaging with a private actor they need to ensure that any type of contracts written are our human rights are embedded in those contracts to mandate human rights outcomes, which is something that we fail to do. Oftentimes what governments say is, we need private sector to come in and therefore we will bow down to them and give them everything they need in order for them to bring their capital and we'll allow them to do whatever they want. And that's something that we can't afford to do anymore. We can't afford to do it for many reasons. So ensuring that the governments have policies that are human that are based in human rights for contracting private actors for guiding the actions of the private market is absolutely key to ensuring that private actors can come in and should come in because they also have human rights responsibilities, but that they can do so in a way that secures human rights outcomes for communities living in informal settlements. Beautiful. Fant what a great uh, a way of, of putting that to the center. I guess this has a lot to do with also the, the key, the recent report launched by Mariana Mazzucato and Leilani on a mission-oriented uh, approach to, to housing uh, housing rights, to advance housing rights. So I think it does, it's a lot of things there that we can draw from, from that paper as well. Camila and Jose, my colleagues, in a, in a few seconds each, any final thoughts from, from you before we close? few seconds is difficult. Thank you very much for everyone. It's really amazing to have like such an amazing panel engaging um, with the discussions that we have been having, we all have been having uh, for so long. Maybe just one thing that I would like to say about like why this, this kind of uh, collective will of keep working on this and many of the comments that have come through, I think 
um, remind us that building a counter narrative and building a, a narrative for action always uh, needs a constant kind of um, reflection about the risks that those narratives bring. And I think many of you have brought to the forefront some of those risks. And we try to address some of those in the report about, as, as well about like, how do we, for instance, when we reinforce calls for investing in housing and we not consider the assets that informal settlements already have and the, and what Lorena was saying about like how the, that they are already contributing to the to the society and we shouldn't ignore that and when we are making this call or the call for financial for, for investment that may call for expanding any foreign financialization or the unintended consequences in particular groups particularly women or those who are in the intersection of uh, different identities I think Having this open conversation about those, what are the risks on the building of counter narratives, on the building of arguments, particularly those that are more quantitative, that for me personally are always a bit more slippery. I think it's really, really important. And thank you, everyone, for the for the inputs in that direction. Jose, any final thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I want to thank you, everyone, for all the amazing comments and and really insightful discussion. And I I would just stress or highlight how uh, mind-blowing it was to review all the evidence that exists around improving housing, uh, habitat as well, the, the whole context where informal settlements are a, a, a base, and, and the impact that that has in people's life, and then the impact that that has beyond people who live there, and uh, beyond in the city and the countries and beyond. And yeah, sometimes you know, sometimes it's about packaging those a little bit, you know, hard science research into something that can be more com communicable, something that can be shared and can sometimes even connect with imagination uh, to get people who should be supporting this to connect and to act upon. So just um, just how much we enjoy doing it and and and. And that's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jose. And I totally agree with the words of my, my colleagues. Uh, just to thank you, all of you, participating in the panel. Thank you for the questions, for in, engaging and listening. And uh, yeah, we are really looking forward to the continued uh, conversations, but also concrete actions on the ground. Uh, because yeah, the time is now, and we really need to seize uh, those, uh, those opportunities at the moment to, to make it count. So Home Eco's campaign has it comes in a you know it's it's urgent to to spread that to to make that work as well as connecting to other ongoing campaigns in this area and what we hope is to build the synergies to to make change happen. So thank you for all of you and uh, and we'll we'll continue in touch. Thank you everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Gracias. Gracias. <laughs> Obrigada. Tchau, tchau.